right, so we'll welcome in our online campus tonight. If you have your Bibles, turn to 2 Timothy chapter number 2. 2 Timothy chapter number 2. Second Timothy chapter number two, and we'll start with verse one. The Apostle Paul writing to a young man named Timothy, given to us in the word of God, tells us, Thou therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus, and the things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men, who shall be able to teach others also. Thou therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. No man that warreth entangleth himself with the affairs of this life, that he may please him who hath chosen him to be a soldier. And if a man also strive by masteries, yet is he not crowned except he strive lawfully. The husbandman that laboreth must be first partaker of the fruits. Consider what I say, and the Lord give thee understanding in all things. Father, again, we thank you for the privilege to be here tonight. Thank you for freedom to come to a place like this and worship you as we see fit. Thank you for the precious, pure, preserved word of God tonight that we can break the bread of life and we can learn something more about you. And Father, I pray that the precious Holy Ghost of God will be our teacher tonight. Conform us to the image of Christ Lord, I pray that you'd give us exactly what we need tonight for this coming week. Help me to say exactly what you want me to say and let me leave my part off. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We, uh, we understand that this thing of the Christian life is a battle. And we are involved in a battle. So because of that reality, we are all soldiers. And so tonight I just want to share some things about a good soldier. Now, I was never in the military. I wanted to real bad. I almost enlisted, and if I had enlisted, we may not be here tonight in meeting in this manner because I would have been right in the middle of Desert Shield and Desert Storm, and I very well could have been a statistic, may not have been here, but it is one of my biggest regrets in life that I never went and served my country. Maybe it's just because I'm a man and I think I'm meaner than a snake and tougher than, than horse hide, I don't know. But I, I've always regretted not enlisting in the military. A lot of my family thinks it would have helped me grow up a little bit, but hey, why grow up? It's overrated, right? <laughs> but in the Christian life, we need to be growing and changing and maturing in our faith in Christ. And, and part, of, part of that, part of the role of the Christian is to be a good soldier. And the Apostle Paul is giving us some things here in 2 Timothy chapter 2 as he's writing to young Timothy and telling him how to be a good soldier. Look back at verse 1. He says, thou therefore. So he's addressing him personally. Thou therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Jesus Christ. In order to be a good soldier, we see here the example of a good soldier. We have to be strong in the grace. What is grace? Grace is God's unmerited favor. We need to see an example of strength. Joshua 1, 7 says, Only be thou strong and very courageous that thou mayest observe to do all to do all the law which Moses, my servant, commanded thee, turn not from it to the right hand or to the left hand, that thou mayest prosper whithersoever thou goest. The word prosper means to do wisely. So if we're going to be a good soldier, we have to be an example of strength. Now, it's not our strength, it's his strength, not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord. We must be strong. We, be, we must be an example of strength. We also must be not just an example, but we must be an insample. And that is a good Bible word. It's like I carry a picture of Miss Tar in my wallet. That picture is an example of her. 
Would you ever take something and have somebody uh, notarize it? When they when they put the paper in those and they squish it, what happens? There's an image, not just on whatever you're notarizing, but some parts of it are raised and some parts of it are not, right? That is a picture of being an ensample. There is an impression made. And so he's saying not only should we be a good example, we should be strong, but we need to be an ensample. We need to not just be an example, we need to have an effect on people around us for the cause of Christ. By the way, church, we're either a good example or we're a bad example. There's no middle ground in the Christian life. We're either causing people to want to draw closer to the Lord Jesus Christ or we are repelling them. We must be obviously Christian, not obnoxiously Christian. And so, so we, we are to be an example of a good soldier. Philippians 3.17 says, Brethren, be followers together of me, and mark them which walk so as ye have us for an ensample. An ensample means literally like we just talked about, a die or a stamp or even a scar. I thought that was interesting. I thought about the scars in the hands of the lovely Lord Jesus Christ. Second Thessalonians 3 verse 9 says, Not because we have not power, but to make ourselves an ensample unto you to follow us. We've got to not just be an example, but we must be an ensample, which also could be a model. And it also could be something that is a warning. Is that not what we should be doing, church? We need to be warning those who are around us that there is coming a day when the Lord Jesus Christ is going to leave heaven and he is going to call his children home. But what are we doing about it? The church of the living God in our day and age is sitting on their hinder parts just I mean, saved, sanctified, glorified, and petrified. Don't ask me to get out of my preserved pew. I'm not going to go anywhere. I'm not going to do anything. I'm not going to say anything. May God forgive us of the state that we find ourselves in. Second Peter chapter 2, and verse 6, it says, In turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, condemn them with an overthrow, making them an ensample unto those that after should live ungodly. The word ensample there means an exhibit for imitation or warning. We should, we should look at what happened to the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah, and it should, number one, it should break our hearts, but it should motivate us to share the gospel with people around us. Because if they don't hear the gospel, receive the gospel, respond to the gospel, and trust Christ as their Savior, they will meet the exact same fate of Sodom and Gomorrah. I don't, God may not send fire down upon their heads and burn them up like those two cities, but there is a real place called hell and real people will spend eternity in that real place. So not only is there the example of a good soldier, secondly, there is the equipment of a good soldier. Verse two says, the same commit thou to faithful men. That is the job of church leadership, is to train men and women, boys and girls. That's why the discipleship class is so important on Sunday afternoons. People who have recently trusted Christ as their Savior need to grow in their relationship with Him. And so we have that class because it starts with the cookies on the bottom shelf to help them to grow. As much as I love a good steak, I didn't start out eating steak. I started out on formula. And thank the Lord, I don't remember what that junk tastes like. But I enjoy meat. I am not a good candidate to be a vegetarian. I eat things that eat vegetables. That's as close as I get. 
But as a good soldier, we must have the proper equipment. And part of being equipped is having proper training. All those years in police, fire, and EMS, and I'm telling you, a lot of times training was just a joke. And there's nothing like being thrown into a situation that you haven't been trained for. And you can't train for everything. You can't. There's no way. But there are some situations that you can be trained for. And so many of the times the training was just... I remember one particular class that we had to take every two years and the instructor, bless his heart, all you had to do was derail him with one question and he would spend almost an entire class time talking about himself. He would, he was so proud of himself and his accomplishments that he had accomplished and he had basically developed the information in this class and the system that it was stored in and, and, and inevitably somebody would ask him and here we go. And we would get almost to the end of the class and he's like, I've got to get back to the material. It's like, yeah, you really do need to because you know, you're gonna give us a test on this. And we had to have it to be certified by the state to do the job or you couldn't do the job correctly. I'm thinking about in 1 Samuel chapter 17, David, this young man came, came out to the battlefield to deliver food to his brothers who were there fighting against the Philistines. Well, they should have been fighting with the Philistines, but they were hiding like little girls and weren't, weren't participating in the battle that they were called to participate in. And young David shows up on the scene and says, hey, I'm not afraid of that fool. Put me in the battle. And what did they do? They went to Saul. They told Saul, hey, uh, David is here, and he says that he'll fight Goliath. So what does Saul do? Saul tries to arm David with his armor. And I wonder, I really wonder, and the Bible doesn't tell us, I wonder if Saul was too afraid to go to the battle, if he wanted to arm David with his armor and all that, so that if people didn't see him up close, that they would think it was King Saul. I can see people doing that. But David looked at the armor, the sword, and he said, I have not proven this. And what does he do? He puts it off and he goes to the battle. He takes a shepherd's bag with his sling and five smooth stones. The Bible doesn't tell us, but a lot of, a lot of men who know more than I do think that he took five stones because Goliath had four brothers. He was going to war. He was a good soldier. What about our weapons, church? Are we familiar with the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God? And, and, and uh, you know, just in the eight months that I've been here, I've got beat Ephesians chapter 6 to death, so we won't go back there tonight. But Ephesians 6, 10 to 18, we see the, the armor that God has given to us, and it would do us well to rehearse that occasionally. I would suggest even uh, one time I saw a message by Dr. Charles Stanley, and he suggested when you get up in the morning, pray on each piece of armor. And I think that's a wonderful practice to get into because we don't know what kind of battles we're going to get into during the day. And we need to be ready to face those as good soldiers of the Lord Jesus Christ. So not only do we see the example of a good soldier, we see the equipment of a good soldier, we need to see the endurance of a good soldier. I mean, we've all known people that, what I call, used to be Christians. You knock on somebody's door, how you doing? You know, for sure, if you die today, you go to heaven. Oh, absolutely, preacher, I'm going. Go to church anywhere? Well, I used to go to, I used to be a, used to be Christians. What's the problem? They didn't endure to the end. And he tells us here in verse 3, he says, Thou therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. He's saying that this is not going to be easy. There's going to be bumps along the way. There's going to be situations that will be unpleasant. But stand for the Lord Jesus Christ and endure whatever comes your way. Easy preaching, but... A little different living. Endure hardness 
as a good soldier. Good means honorable. Honorable. Are we honorable before God? 2 Thessalonians 1 verse 4 says, So that we ourselves glory in you in the churches of God for our patience and faith in all your persecutions and tribulations that ye endure. Endure means to hold oneself up against. That means no matter what comes at you, you just put your shoulder down like that big fat football player on the line. Just drop your shoulder and drive. Every time I think about that, it reminds me of the, the time when my father and I took a scuba class together and the, we slept in the bed of his truck and the, it rained at night and the, he didn't get the truck parked right and the, the tarp that he put over the bed of the truck started catching water. I woke up in the wee hours of the morning and I kept elbowing him, get off of me, get off of me. When I turned over and looked, it wasn't him, it was a big blue bubble between us that was full of water. There was hundreds of gallons of water in that thing. And I finally got his attention because we were kind of, you know, pinned in there under the weight of the water and he got the water out and moved the truck up a little bit and we didn't have any more problems. But lean into it, we must endure, we must have the endurance of a good soldier. Bad things are going to happen to good people for our good and for his glory. So we might as well just resign ourselves that these things are going to happen and we're going to live for God no matter what. Hebrews 12, 7 says, If ye endure chastening, God dealeth with you as with sons. Sometimes we have to endure chastening when, when we've let our endurance slip. Fourthly, we see the entanglement of a good soldier. Verse 4 says, No man that warreth entangleth himself with the affairs of this life, that he may please him who hath chosen him to be a soldier. Entangleth means to be interwoven. When I, when I read this verse, I thought about some training that we had done on the fire department when we were in southern Indiana. When you drive by the fire department and you see those shipping containers out and around there, they use those for training. Uh, sometimes they're what's called a flashover chamber, but we one of them, one of them in we I'm not on the fire department down there anymore. One of those in Georgetown was set up as an entrapment chamber, and so what you do is you suit up full gear, helmet, turnout gear, air pack, the whole shebang. When they close the door, church, I'm telling you, it's it is dark. There is no light gets in those whatsoever. And there are literally traps set up inside that shipping container to make you get tangled up. So that in a real life situation, you don't flip out, blow through all the air in your air tank, and you can learn to manage it uh, the way you should. Because I'm telling you, I, I'm sure you folks may or may not have ever thought about it, but you can go through a tank of air real quick when you're caught up, when you're entangled. Because you start <laughs> hyperventilating. Man, I mean, the next thing you know, the bell on that air tank's going off, and that just complicates things. So now you're like, oh, my word, I'm trapped, and now I'm about to run out of air. And you panic. Been there, done that. Anyway, the entanglement chamber. And I mean, there is ropes stretched through there, cables, everything. I remember one time... And I need to quit telling stories, but it's hard to believe, I know, but when I went through my classes the first time, we had to, we had to go between two studs in a house, a fake wall. 16 inches on center, studs are. So I'm looking at this wall, and it's mostly drywall except between those two studs, and I'm like, how am I going to get all of this through that 16-inch hole? I want you to know I made it and nobody got hurt. But you have to plan ahead of time or you'll get entangled. Just in case you're wondering, so you're not on pins and needles, you take your air pack off and you set it through the hole and then you shimmy sideways and those two by four studs grunt like nobody's business and they move out a little bit as you go through and they go right back into place where they're supposed to. Put your hair pack on and go back, go on back to work. 
It's possible. The church, we have to plan ahead of time to prevent ourselves from being entangled in the things of the world. What are we going to do when temptation comes our way? What are we going to do, men, when a, a woman of ill repute tries to attract our attention? I won't say who it was, but I heard a, a story of a fairly well-known preacher that a woman walked into his office and pulled her shirt back and bore her chest to him. And he said, my wife has a set just like those at home and left the room. You never know what the devil's going to send you. Ladies, you never know. The dirty dog devil might send you a thousand dollar visa shopping card that's not yours. Think all the shoes you could buy with that. But I'm telling you, he knows what will ensnare and entangle us and he is expert of tying things up in front of us and if we're not careful, we'll be entangled Again, and I, I know I say this often, we cannot be unsaved, for lack of a better term, but we can be rendered useless to the kingdom of God. And if we're caught up in some type of entanglement, we're no good. The entanglement of a good soldier. The exception of a good soldier. Verse 5 says, and if a man also strive for masteries, yet is he not crowned, except he strive lawfully. Lawfully means legitimately. That means no cheating. Cheater, cheater, pumpkin eater. If we're going to do God's work, we have to do it God's way. I'm going to close with this illustration. I, this is something that I have had in my files since 2006, and I went looking for it the other day. I can only remember part of it. This is, to me, this was very powerful. The city of Pompeii was destroyed by the eruption of Mount Vesuvius in AD 70. A Roman soldier was caught in the flow and frozen, standing at his post, but dead. We would call that petrified. The soldier, frozen in time, was going about his business when suddenly his world changed. He changed along with it and just as suddenly. The tragedy in this city and this soldier is that ample warning was given to the impending eruption and no one paid any attention to the warnings. They figured that the volcano would erupt, but in fact, they figured it would erupt a few days down the road. When it did explode, red hot lava ran over the sides of the crater and it moved a lot faster than what anyone ever dreamed that it would that day. Their erroneous thinking and failure to escape is now written indelibly in history books and travel books all over the world. Church, you and I are warned to beware of those little foxes. We're warned against lukewarmness and many other things like embracing evil. Yet many think that they're standing, but yet they're deader than a doornail on the inside. How about us tonight? Are we standing? Are we standing there? ready to face whatever God tells us to face? Are we standing in love for God? Are we in love with him? Are we in that standing position and frozen, deader than a doornail, like that Roman soldier in Pompeii? Only you know that. Stay at our feet tonight. Our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed. Father, thank you for the, the word of God and for the privilege to come tonight to your house I pray, Father, that you would encourage us through your word. Lord, help us to walk with you. Help us to love your word, to read it, obey it, study it. And Father, I pray that when we're called each and every day to be good soldiers, that you would help us to do exactly that. And Father, I pray that when you come and take us home to be with you, that you would find each and every one of us faithful to the very end. 
Father, that the day we stand before you will be able to hear, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Bless your people, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.